in the name of our risen Lord, I bid you a good morning, and this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is William Nickran, and I have the privilege of serving as your pastor here at Pittsburgh United Methodist Church, where our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And uh, our, our vision, and the way that we live out that mission is through our vision uh, to, to make God real by loving, connecting, and serving just like Jesus. And I'm so glad that you've chosen to worship with us online. As many of you know, we have chosen to suspend our in-person worship for just this Sunday. And we're doing this out of an abundance of of caution. Um, you see, last week we had a confirmed positive here, uh, not only in our worship service, but also um, during our church picnic. And to not have a super spreader, to not uh, put others in harm, we've chosen to, to say, hey, let's, let's suspend for one week, just today, in order to keep everyone healthy and for us to move forward. So for everyone that has shown us grace and patience during this time, I know you want to be here in these pews, and we want you to be here too. So just hold on for one more week, and we'll be glad to welcome you back. Um, speaking of, of welcoming people back, um, today was supposed to be our Back to Church Sunday, but unfortunately, that didn't, take, uh, that didn't, that didn't happen today because we can't do that. So I want to share with you a quick video to get you excited about inviting your friends about inviting your friends uh, to worship with this uh, with us uh, this coming Sunday so t take a look at this video hope is here it's your church joining together with thousands of other churches across the nation to reignite togetherness re-engage our communities and reach people with the hope of Jesus Back to Church Sunday has been celebrated every fall for the past 12 years. It is a movement of Christ followers reaching every neighborhood to invite every person to a Bible-believing church where they can discover true community. But this year, after world-changing events have affected us all, something new is happening. It's time for the church to bring us together again in an unprecedented way. This is Hope's Comeback. Millions of people invited to a church near them. And on September 19th, more people than ever before on one day will be introduced to Jesus, experience his hope, and connect with others. It's time to love again, serve again, and hope again. So we're still going to love, hope, and serve, but not on that date. As you saw in the video, it said today, but again, we're postponing till next Sunday. And I do hope that you can invite those that maybe you haven't seen in church for a while. Uh, maybe the waiter that comes to your table or someone that you know is just having a tough time. Invite them to come be part of our worship service. We'd be so glad to have them. Now, uh, because of COVID-19, I do want to remind you uh, that tomorrow night, uh, we do have a leadership team. We're going to have it uh, a dual one of in-person and online, and we are going to be discussing COVID-19 protocol, so please be aware of updates. Right now, the mask uh, we don't have a, an all-out mask mandate that may be coming, so we will let you know as soon as possible. Right now, our stance on it is, is that we highly recommend masks while you're in worship. Um, um, so again, we will give that up update as soon as we can after our leadership team meeting tomorrow night. Um, we do um, have our, 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 an opportunity to, to, of the item of the month for our outreach team. They're two liter bottles, and we're going to be playing a game for, um, what is it called? That's right, our national night out on October 5th. So if you'd like to donate uh, uh, two liters as prizes for our game, uh, we could really use that. You can drop them off right here at the church. You don't even have to come in. You can put them in the breezeway, and we'll take care of it from there. And the last announcement I have for you is not next week, but the following week, we are starting a brand new sermon series. Uh, it's, it's entitled The Upside Down Kingdom. And we're going to go through some of Jesus' most famous parables about how he turns regular things upside down. And we are called to be upside down people. So again, I know today looks different, but I'm so glad and thankful that you are still joining us in worship. We pray that you would have an encounter with the risen Lord, that you'd be inspired and encouraged. So let us now join together in these moments of worship. Amy? Good morning, Pittsburgh United Methodists. My name is Amy Moni, and I have the privilege of being your liturgist this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who follow the ways of the Lord. 
God's ways are are just just and and merciful. Those who follow God's ways are continually nourished in faith. In In all all that that they they do, they they prosper. Come, let us open our hearts to God's compassionate love. Let Let us us celebrate God's God's mercy and justice. justice. Amen. Amen. I'm trading my sorrow I'm trading in my shame I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord, be with with us us this day, day, helping helping us us to to put put our priorities in order so that that we may faithfully serve you by serving your people. Heal our spirits. Enable us to follow your ways all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are again, not together as we all want to be, but We're going to pass the peace anyway. So reach out, shake hands, grab a hug from those that are with you. Give a little wave to us here in the sanctuary. We miss you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. All right. I love it again. Thanks for being in worship. And this is our time of offering. Yes, it's already offering time in the worship space. And this is our opportunity to give back just a portion of the many blessings that our God has bestowed upon us. I do want to remind you that online giving is available. Thank goodness. Um, It's available at pittsburghumc.org backslash giving. You can also mail in your tithes, your gifts, and your offerings. And I just want to say um, that this congregation has been incredibly faithful during this time. So thank you for your faithful. Thank you for pivoting and learning how to do all this online giving, and and I know that your gifts are going a long way to not only bless this community, to bless uh, our nation and our world, so thank you. So let us now offer up a word of thanksgiving for this offering. God of love and service, we thank you for loving and serving us through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless these gifts that others may be loved and served in our giving. Bless our lives that we may love and serve one another as you have loved and served us. It's in your loving name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My Lord, dear best, my righteousness, oh God. Amen and amen. And now we get the sacred opportunity to set apart time where we get to be reminded of the Spirit of God. And I know maybe in the place that you're at, you could be traveling somewhere, you could be in your home, you could even be in your office right now. And we know that it's hard to take those moments of pause, of multitasking when the service is live this way. But we encourage you to stop what you're doing, to take that breath and be reminded of the presence of God, and to lift up those joys, those concerns, all that you are to God, and be reminded of the presence of God. So let's pause for just a moment to, to allow that, that Spirit of God to work within us, and then we will pray together. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, we come before you once again, bringing forth all of our hopes and all of our dreams. O oh God, we live our lives as best as we can, dealing with difficult relationships and situations, putting failures and disappointments behind us, and moving into each new day with as much energy, goodwill, and optimism as we can muster up. But here, right now, O oh God, we seldom have the right answers. We seldom seek your higher wisdom in our lives, and we just move ahead. We just keep going. So, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us for not asking for your insight, for not coming to you first. And God, we ask that you'd fill us with your wisdom, that we may live lives of goodness and peace. We draw near to you, O oh God, source of all understanding, and ask you to draw near to us. Teach us your wisdom from above, that we may bear good fruit in our lives. Root us beside the streams of, of your wisdom, that the green leaves of your goodness, fed by your insight, may not wither. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verse 3, and then verses 7 and 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Chapter 4. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you are wrongly, you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Well, good morning once again, and welcome back to our sermon series based on the small yet mighty book of James. You see, the book of James consists of only five chapters, yet is chocked full of practical theological principles we can put into practice immediately, such as taming our tongue with an overall, uh, with an overall tone to put our faith into action. And next week, we'll finish up the last chapter in this book. The clear speech found in James is refreshing. It's so nice. After reading the parables of Jesus and the apocalyptic text of the book of Revelation, it is nice to have some simple yet profound ways to, to live out our faith and put it into practice. You see, there is a lot going on in today's scripture passages. As Amy did such a great job reading uh, today's passage for us, we, we can read it and be like, wow, what's the takeaway? There's so much uh, to, to take away from this passage. There's a lot about wisdom for sure, but the wise counsel that stands out to me is in relation to living out the good and content life, right? Living out the good and content life, being content with our own flesh and blood, being content with our lives where we are right here and right now. So that's, that's a focus for today. James talks about how all the various ways that humans live in broken relationships with each other can be located in one source. In the passage we hear about talking about envy, uh, in, the, in the passage we read, you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in dispute and conflicts. And as you, we just heard, it even talks about you even commit murder to get what you don't. So envy, it's a huge focus, important uh, part of the passage I want to talk about today. Now, of course, the most obvious manifest manifestation of this kind of envy is a material possessions. We compare what we lack with what those around us have, and it becomes easier to crave a bigger house, a fancier, uh, a fancier car, a fuller stock profile, finer furniture, and better clothes. And I even says, I heard someone say this week, and a better designer dog. I'm not sure what that means, but I heard that this week as well. All the while, we tend to believe that better goods constitute a better life. Who hasn't heard that lie? If it's bigger, it's better. If you just get more stuff, you're going to be happier. But as I've taught many times in stewardship, and this life of this congregation is more possessions take more possession over our life. And it does never, it never works the way we think it's going to do. 
But James fervently disputes that notion that bigger means better, more means better. A better life is not found in amassing more material goods. Instead, it is found in works that are done with gentleness born of wisdom. I'm going to say that again. This passage, this is um, chapter 3, verse 13. In the last part of that passage, if you go back and look at it, it says gentleness born of wisdom. But what, what does that mean? And, and I'm going to get to that. And curiously enough, this is the only place in the entire Bible where this phrase is found. One does not usually associate gentleness with wisdom, as it is not often assumed that the two, uh, that the two ones necessarily go hand in hand. Okay, there's gentleness and there's wisdom. Why would you put those together and why is it so important? It is possible, for example, for someone to have a gentle disposition, but do things that are full-hearted. Full-hearty, I can say that word, right? And it is equally possible for wise people to be arrogant and domineering in the way they relate to others. So obviously, James is trying to tell us something here. But this passage is incredibly clear, at least to my understanding. To live the best kind of life, one needs to have both, for, both of these attributes, for they offer an important balance, and they balance each other out. When one is truly humble, self-giving, and kind, then the wisdom that one gains will be used for the benefit of others. We just talked a lot about this, is that why, why, do, we, why do we get our faith? Why do, we get, why do we have to do works? It's not about having to, it's about getting to. About God working something in our life that we can't contain, that we must work out and live out. It's for the benefit of others and in service to the world. When one seeks genuine wisdom from God, we're not talking about going to a seer and learning wisdom of this earth. We're talking about drawing closer to God. When one uh, seeks genuine wisdom from God, then one is able to be self-composed, uh, content, and disciplined in the way one relates to others. And who wouldn't want that? I'm going to say that one more. When one gen seeks genuine wisdom from God, then one is able to be self-composed, we all could need that, especially in hot-tempered moments. Content and discipline in the way one relates to others. We like to overcomplicate this concept of wisdom, and at least I know I do, and I'm sure there's someone else out there that does as well. But the simplest way to obtain it is to live out the teachings of Jesus. Go back to God's teachings. Go back to Jesus and how God, Jesus lived Jesus' life and to lean into the fruits of the spirits. And if you have forgotten the fruit of the spirits, I tried to do it by memory this morning. I got all but one, so I thought that was pretty good. Um, so your pastor struggles with them as well. But love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and the one I'm really focusing on today, it's right here in the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness, and the one we, we tend to ignore, self-control. I'm going to say those one more time in case you're writing them down or you missed it the first time. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we're wanting to be wise, we seek those things in God. Ultimately, having a gentleness of wisdom, that's back to that phrase that James used that I'm really focusing on today, it provides the clearest, most effective antidote. I like that language, especially in the season we're on in right now. We could all use an antidote right now to the problem of envy, contentment. Contentment's that, that, that antidote. And to be content is to believe or to have wisdom that one has all that one needs and therefore to refuse to mistreat or demean others uh, because of that desire. You, you no longer have the desire that you're content with what you have, so the desire to hurt or harm or, or, or to talk down on, that's not even in your vocabulary anymore. When one is truly content with what one has, then there is a freedom that is unlike any other in the world and is truly the best life, and God wants this life for you. God wants you to be free of the rat race of, oh, I need the new X, Y, or Z. I need to get this. I need to get that. Oh, I need this bigger. Oh, I'm not going to be happy yet because I'm still pursuing. Pursuit of something is great, but everything we pursue must be through the filter of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. All right, you know when I get a chance to use some of my favorite fantasy movies, I'm going to do it in the sermon. So here we go. In this children's classic, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Yes, I get to use Harry Potter in a sermon today. Uh, 
thank you for letting me do this. <laughs> There's an important conversation between the young student, uh, Harry Potter, and the headmaster of schools, uh, Albus Dumbledore. I know I was told not to do accents anymore, but I can't help it. Um, Harry had discovered a peculiar artifact called the Mirror of Erised. And I say it wrong every time, but it's this what, the, what I'm showing you right now. And this mirror is a, <clears throat> a magical mirror. <coughs> mirror, which reflected back to the observer that which they most deeply and most desperately desire in their lives. And if you've never seen the movies or read the books, what uh, Dumbledore really gets at is this is a very dangerous device. People have wasted away in front of this mirror, looking at the deepest desires and longing them, longing for them. For Harry, it was the image of, can you see what's in there? That's right. He lost his family while he was a baby for his long deceased parents. For his friend Ron, we see uh, it was an image of himself holding the house trophy. It was their house won and he was happy. Dumbledore explained the power of the mirror and Harry in this way. And I love this quote. Again, the wisdom of the old uh, wizard here. The happiest man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Erised like a normal mirror, that is. He would be able to see himself exactly as he is. If you're looking to be content, if you're looking for true, another word we could use for this is happiness, but it's not the same as contentment. If you're wanting to be okay in your own skin, that's where we're trying to get to, to look in the mirror and to not see the blemishes, to look in the mirror and not think, what if I would have done this or that other? All that is left behind and all we see is that the creation that God made and God says, and I did good. Man, I showed off with this one. That's what we're supposed to be seeing when we look in our mirrors, magical or not. And if you do have a magical mirror, I would be very interested in it. All right, we're moving on. So James suggests to us that the best life can be defined in, in the precisely that manner. It is a life in which contentment rather than envy is the rule of our life. That can be achieved only when one has gained two important per personal attributes. And yes, you've guessed them. Gentleness and the pursuit of wisdom. wisdom. Again, James says wisdom, but I think there's something to be said about that pursuit, that not giving up on seeking God with your whole heart, your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole self. Again, wisdom, we often find to be a sticking point for most of us. Well, I'm not a wise person. Well, again, through God, we can be what we never thought we could be. Now, see, James' advice on how to live into that wisdom ends up emphasizing the type of ethic that generally, uh, that general, general revelation of the sort that natural law or one's mother would provide. So again, we're looking for this, this gigantic, oh, wisdom has been inspired to me. I've had this miraculous moment. And the reality, James is saying, guys, it's, it's in the day-to-day. -day. It's a normal stuff. James says, be careful whom you spend time with. All right, my mom told me that, right? It's practical, lived-out wisdom. Watch your tongue, that's what we just talked about last week. Yeah, we need to be reminded of that. And I'm guessing from last week, you need to be reminded of again. I know I do. Be kind to others. Where, where do we get that from? The golden rule. Who gave us the golden rule? Jesus. Treat others the way that you'd want to be treated. Again, wisdom, we often find to be the sticking point uh, for us. But it's the practical, ethical ways of, of being kind to one another, uh, and, 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 and it's the way that God calls us. It's not earth-shaking stuff, friends. It's the day-to-day, -day, and I, as I, I heard other people say, it's being a good person, yes, but for the purpose of God, for that deeper relationship and understanding of God and God's people. But you see, but that's part of James' wisdom, isn't it? That is down-to-earth wisdom that we can actually metabolize and live out it's not some abstract idea that we're never going to hit. That, uh, that it's a distinctly Christian version of the world does not remove us from addressing the commonplace obligations that come with everyday life, right? So there's this upper world and uh, of the world that James talks about, but we can never get rid of any of that. We got to live into the world that we are a part of. For James, being heavenly wise, that's his language, doesn't mean disconnecting ourselves from the routine of life as if we could asunder ourselves for, from matter that are not beneath us. And instead, what James has recognized that Christian wisdom expresses itself in the routine and mundane matters of living in, but not of the world. Unfortunately, I got the opportunity to live this out this week. 
Uh, many of you have reached out and sent your prayers and support to my family. Um, you know that we're going on two weeks of my father being in the hospital, and um, he has an underlier uh, lung condition, and with pneumonia, it's been a tough roller coaster of the last two weeks. And what I've realized is that golden rule, do unto others as you'd want done unto you. Yes, we're in crisis. Yes, we're tired. Yes, we're exhausted. Yes, we're scared out of our minds of if, if my dad's going to rally or not, right? We, we get those moments of fear and anxiety, but in those moments, we're, we're treating our nurses with compassion. We're thanking them for the work that they're doing, and we can see the tiredness on their faces as well, and we're, and, and we're bringing them donuts. That wasn't my idea. That was my sister's idea to bring donuts and to show support and care and to do that. When we do that, it's not that, oh, we want to make sure my dad gets the best care. It's because it's the decent right thing to do, that to treat others the way you want to be treated, to show that earthly wisdom of saying, why would you do this? Because this is the way I'd want to be treated. And more importantly, this is how my God has taught me to treat others. The audience was awed when the world famous violinist announced before the concert that he would be playing one of the world's most expensive violins. And yes, I moved from my last story to a next one. I do that occasionally. His co composition was played brilliantly. Again, the most expensive violin in the world, and this master, oh man, he killed it. I guess you can't really, it's not like a rock concert, but he did a really good job. The master violinist played the number without a single the, uh, mistake, and the audience was thrilled. They were captivated. They were all in. You know, something else could be happening in there. They didn't know it because they were so captivated. Then the musician took the instrument and smashed it on the floor. The strings and wood flew across the stage. The audience was shocked and assumed the violinist had gone mad. They, those really good uh, musicians, sometimes they go a little crazy. So to them, it made sense. But not our musicians. Man, they're, they're awesome. Until he explained that the vi good, good save, right? I hope so. Until he, ex he explained that the violin he had just destroyed was a cheap imitation he bamboozled them. He said, listen, you thought I did the greatest thing, and you thought it was because of the instrument being the most expensive. Now watch this. And he, bl he blew it up, if you will. He threw it on the ground, and then picking up the expensive instrument, the one that he actually was talking about, this is the actual one. He wore special gloves and everything else, and he began to play again. And amazingly, most people could not tell the difference. The quality of the instrument was secondary to the skills of the musician. We get so caught up on needing to know all the exact wisdom. We get all caught up that I have to wait till I'm holy enough to do this, that, or the another, that, that I can't be content with who I am until I do X, Y, or Z. But it's never about us. It's never been about us. It's always been about God. So it is with us who would live the good life. The beauty of a, a kind deed does not rely on the physical, financial, or, self, or social well-being of the individual who performs it. The master can take ordinary instruments like you and me and produce beautiful music with our lives. Good deeds done in humi humility or gentleness, as we talked about, comes from heavenly wisdom. Because of our faith, the good works, I'm repeating it once again, three weeks we're at it, right? Because of our faith, we do good works. And it's not about us. Don't overthink this. It's all about God. And I must repeat myself now because I'm still not sure you got it just yet. Ultimately, having a gentleness of wisdom provided the clearest, most effective antidote to the problem of envy. We call that contentment. To be content is to believe that one has all that one needs and therefore to refuse to mistreat or, de or demean others. When one is fully content with what one has, that then there is a freedom that is unlike any others in this world. It truly is the best life. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is something that has been a deep trouble in my life. I grew up looking at the classified ads of fear or FOMO is what they called out, fear of missing out with a major case of FOMO that I had to look at the classified ads, had to look at the garage sales, had to do everything because I didn't want to miss that great deal that would set me up for success, that I could turn it around and sell it for more and that I could have bigger and better, provide for my family more and be a better person because of that. I struggle with this even to this day 
of, of, of thinking that I need more to be content. But when we believe that one has all that one needs and therefore to refute or to mistreat or demean others, we, we refuse that idea that I don't need to put somebody else off to be a blessing. Like, because God blessed me, I can be happy there. So what do you think? What's that thing that you can let go of? What's that one thing that you can be reminded of to, be, to find contentment with what you already have? Why? Because it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. So as you live this out this week and you put this into practice, again, we're putting faith that works. Every time we preach, I hope you're, you tamed your tongue last week for the most part, right? I hope this week that you're looking into what would it look for me to be content? What do I have to let go of? What do I have to push into to be content in my life? How can you tell if someone is in that contentment? How can you tell if someone's in that good life? Look at the people who surround him or her. Are those people smiling? Are they happy and content? Are they being lifted up by that person? Are their lives richer because of that friendship? How is it with you? Are your friends have spent an evening with you? Do they come away feeling better about themselves? Have their spirits been lifted? Their thoughts elevated? Have the words you have spoken improved the quality of their lives? The truth is, that the green eye of envy is going to rear its ugly head no matter how hard we try. But knowing whose we are will help us remember who we are. Remembering whose we are will help us remember who we are. And that contentment comes from that relationship. We are beloved children of God. We are, brought, we are bought. We have been saved and we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You see, God loves us so much. And it's overwhelming just to think about God sent his one and only son to die for us so that we might not only have life, but have life everlasting. Overwhelming love. Yet somehow we continue to confuse ourselves and think that our worth and value should come from things. Our worth and value should come from people's perspectives on us and even our own abilities. What a joke. But we come back to it time and time again, it's not about us. Yep, you're getting it, right? Thank you. It's about God. I heard you. Yep, you guys are doing great out there. So listen to this. Someone needs to hear this. I know you've, I've landed the plate three times, right? Okay, we're running slow on gas. So we're going to get there, all right? So hold on. Our value does not come from our own strengths and talents, but from God above. You see, the noun value is a very old English word uh, deriving from the Latin word valere, meaning to be strong or to be of value. So to value, there is a strength, but it's, it's not of, of, of economic value. It's of your own strength, or as Christians, it's the strength that we have of the Holy Spirit in us. The word has meant the worth of worthy, worth or worthiness of someone or something. And it wasn't until the 19th century that the word value convey the worth of something in an economic sense, a dollar sense. The newer meaning of value has been to, to, to the detriment of countless people around the world. When we put price tags on people's lives, we start to no longer see them as people, but as objects and hopefully brothers and sisters in Christ. Hopefully by now everyone has seen the horrific folly in such thinking. When we associate a person's worth and value to a dollar sign, we create space of dehumanizing ourselves and such tra travesties as slavery and human trafficking is brought into this world. Just like the example of the master violinist, our value does not come from us but our master, Jesus, the Messiah. So we must lean on the practical advice of James once again. And in verse 7, submit our, four, chapter 4, verse 7, submit ourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. No, that's not all about negative content here. It's saying, call to action. James says it's time. It's time for us to stop being miserable. It's time for us to lop, stop living in shame. It's stop, time for us to be fully content and fully reliant on our Lord and Savior. And my friends, there's going to be a lot of moments when we fail at this. And this is where the community of believers come together and they lift us up and they say, listen, 
you are continuing to make a difference in my life, and right now you're struggling, and I'm going to walk alongside with you. So I encourage you this week. How are you going to work on contentment this week? Write it down. Put it in your phone. Put it on your screen. So every time you turn it in the phone, I'm going to work on this relationship. I'm going to go and do this, whatever it may be. Be intentional about it. I hope you worked on intentionality about taming your tongue. I hope you were intentionality about living out your faith rather than just sitting in a pew or talking to with another Christian, that you are going out and living it out. God is the key to our contentment. And I pray, I pray that you will be reminded of this day and you will put that into action. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, the PUMC Praise Band is going to take us out of worship today with Counting Every Blessing. I was blind, now I'm seeing color. I was dead. had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to a treasure. I've been given
counting every blessing, for you are good to me. I pray you believe that and understand that to be true in your life. Uh, before I give the benediction, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to thank our skeleton crew of five people that are here in the sanctuary making this happen. You guys are awesome. Um, and again, I can't uh, say enough. We are looking so forward to seeing you next Sunday. So for everyone that joined us in worship, thank you for being a part of this. And if you are able, yes, even online, even if this is a, a while back, I invite you to stand for the benediction. And if you're in a car, maybe not. So I encourage you, if you if you safely, maybe you're the passenger, maybe you can lift your hands. So receive now this benediction. Go in confidence and peace, joyfully serving the Lord who walks with you. Bring hope to the hopeless, joy to those who sorrow, and peace to the afflicted. Be true witnesses to the love of God through Jesus Christ and invite you once again. Go in peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I am happy.